planning an event and wondering how you can give your attendees the best experience possible? Take advantage of customized meetings with Hilton that make it easier than ever to incorporate health, wellness, and great breaks. Hilton will help you build an extraordinary meeting that attendees will remember. To book your next meeting or event, go to meetings.hilton.com. Welcome to Gather Geeks, a podcast by BizBash, the place where people passionate about meetings and events come together. Here are your hosts, BizBash CEO David Adler and Editor-in-Chief Beth Kormanick. Welcome to Gather Geeks. David is away today. Scott Merkin is executive producer of Philadelphia-based ESM Productions. The company's work spans political events with the likes of former presidents Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, to concerts like this year's Bud Light Super Bowl Music Festival, to Pope Francis's visit to Philadelphia in 2015. The company also has extensive experience live streaming events. I spoke with Scott about ESM's partnership with Jay-Z's Rock Nation, security at major events, and some technical best practices for live streaming events. Take a listen. Hi, Scott. Welcome to Gather Geeks. How you doing? I'm well. Thanks for joining us today. Um, so let's just start by having you give a, a just a quick background of your life and events. Uh, it's, I'm asking you to condense 30 years into uh, a, a quick um, soundbite, but but tell us about how you got involved in events and how you found your niche in this world. Okay, I'll do it as I'll do it. And try to make it uh, the 30, which is probably a, a 40 year story as quickly as I can. Um, I grew up around production. My dad is a retired broadcast engineer, and in lieu of throwing a football around, which we did a little bit of, um, dad would would take me and my older brother maybe to the to the studio and watch news being produced live, or um, maybe watch a story being edited, or um, and this is in the mid to late 70s, a live shot coming in, which was but, you know, almost as, as impressive as the moon uh, launch back in those days. So got a chance to really understand what that was. And, and from, from a very young age, probably seven or eight, I really loved the idea of, okay, now it's live. Mm -hmm. So the lights are different and everything's different. Um, I remember seeing, you know, people in the news, the news, uh, anchors and things like that. Uh, would be wearing coats and suits and ties and everything at, from the waist up. But then if it was in the middle of summertime and then you'd see they're wearing Hawaiian shorts or something because the camera didn't see that. So what the camera sees and what the camera didn't see, what the audience sees and what the audience didn't see was fascinating to me as a, as a little kid even. And, um, uh, wanted to, I knew I wanted to do something in that. I also love music, grew up around music. My, my dad and my uncle and my brother and everybody just playing instruments around the house and loving music. So, I realized that there were these stages that had music and, and concerts. And um, even at a young age, I was really into uh, music documentaries and things like that. In fact, when I was about 12, my dad brought home from work this amazing concert that he grabbed off the satellite dish the night before of The Who. And it was from in 1982, the live, this live concert. Um, he brought it home um, on broadcast tape. And we happened to have a, like everybody did a broadcast machine in our basement, right? Everyone had that. <laughs> sure. and, and, um, but at the age of like 12, I watched it literally every day for probably two years. Um, and, and kind of reverse engineered how, how it was done, how the music was cut to the beat, what the lighting looked like and how the artists interacted with each other and the sign language they gave each other to communicate. And, and that was the, that was the aha moment for me where I was like, I want to do this. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, I got into my first job was, was really in a sound or AV type of capacity where setting up microphones. I also knew that, you know, you're not going to start by working for the who, right? right? Even though I wanted to. Um, so, you know, doing corporate events and setting up mics and, um, doing all those things, but also really, you know, perf perfecting, if you will, my craft of everything's going to go well live. Um, and, um, worked at a company from the age of 18 to 25 doing that and became also um, a, a, a face for the production, uh, the interface sometimes, which um, I didn't even realize what the definition was at the time, but I was becoming a producer. Okay. And so when you're interfacing with, with the client, clients with the, and the also the crew mm -hmm. and the talent, mm -hmm. all, the, the glue, if you will, right? Mm -hmm. Putting that all together and, and um, making it happen on time um, and, and, and making sure that it went well. And it's amazing um, even at a young age, I was in my early 20s, I, I think I realized at that moment that no one else is going to do this. 
there's a bunch of people here. That, like it was maybe it was the mayor of Philadelphia or something like that. I'm like, well, the mayor's standing there, and people who went on the speaker are all standing there. And he said to, he he knew me, so he said, Scott, I got to be out of here in 40 minutes. So I think he wants me to make sure this thing starts and ends. Um, and then that's that was sort of the beginning of my career as a producer, mm -hmm. um, and um, really just got into a rhythm of of being visible, making sure that we had the appropriate technology and most importantly, knew all the information, shared all the information and had enough time to set it up properly so that it looked like we didn't do anything and the people showed up and just started talking. Right. And so at what point did you open your own company? So I was 25, uh, 26, I guess it was 1996. Um, I'd worked for this other company that, that was, I learned a lot and I was extremely grateful. That company, believe it or not, and the company that had been in this kind of industry had already been in business for 50 years and was in its sunset, if you will. And they had no, um, real success in planning and, and they had other things that were quite honestly delivering better returns, whether it be real estate investments, things like that. And this was in the mid nineties in which that was the beginning of a renaissance in Philadelphia, uh, from a perspective of events. We were going after political conventions. Um, we were, we were creating under the leadership of the then mayor Ed Rendell, um, a tourism economy, which meant a larger convention center, meant putting money into the historic district, attracting people. Um, and, uh, in very quickly in 1997, um, the biggest test run that Philly could have had was this big, huge event called the President's Summit for America's Future. And at the time, and it had all of the um, living uh, pres former and current presidents, and it was a big initiative. It was a thing that, that launched Colin Powell's America's Promise, which is still today with the Red Wagon, mm -hmm. still today, mm -hmm. very, very effective volunteer organization across the United States. Because of I was this young guy still uh, in 1997, but that Mayor Rendell knew could you know, hey, when this kid's around, things are working okay. I got a, I, I was fortunate enough to land a significant role at a very young age in that in that event, and that really catapulted my career as a as an event producer. And and, and our company was only a year old at the time, and uh, that that just continuous rhythm mm -hmm. of getting involved in events, working really hard, making them successful, and then of course going and being able to point and talk about those events right. uh, to be considered for the next ones and. Um, the my uh, got a, got a chance to do some national things with the DNC because of the the successes I'd had with those things and that was really the beginning of the intersection with entertainment was when I was doing major presidential events for the DNC right in the late 90s early 2000s that's so interesting yeah I I, I look at your your body of work and and music events and political events are have have remained um some temp poles there. Yeah. Um, well, I like to, they're all the, when you put a person on stage and they're rock stars in their own light to mm -hmm, some degree. And, mm -hmm. uh, it's no wonder or it's, it's no surprise, um, that many of the, up until a very last moment, a lot of those things are exactly the same until you put the person on stage. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Well, so another, um, uh, a turning point or a, a big highlight in your business was uh, a couple years ago, your partnership with Rock Nation. Tell us about what that means. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> it goes back um, to, I guess, early 2012, where um, um, our company in Philly, along with um, uh, some strategic partners like The Roots, um, we, had, we had a good history of producing large scale live outdoor events this we were we were doing this thing for on vh1 called the philly fourth of july jam that we created along with with the roots um, that was live um both on vh1 and also about six or seven hundred thousand people in the audience standing on the ben franklin parkway and um it was a tremendous success both for the boots on the ground or the folks on the ground to experience it. it was free largest free concert in america it was really an amazing thing and and folks who couldn't be in philadelphia of course could watch it uh on 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 vh1 live and of course in all the time zones and and it even had a life afterwards as like a package piece um so with that with that success and some other things um that i had done in the, around the city that included large audiences um in in uh, in 2008, when the Phillies won the World Series, I organized the celebration and the parade. And those those of folks who understand Philadelphia sports, that's not an everyday thing to plan a championship <laughs> right. uh, celebration. So I don't know. Um, lately, lately, yeah. Um, <laughs> I was 10 when the Phillies won in, in 1980, and my dad tells a story about how he was in the microwave truck 
being rocked back and forth down at the stadium. And I got to say, well, we, I, we ran the parade. But, but anyway, we had um, a lot of credibility and, and experience on uh, not just nationally, but in Philadelphia on this parkway. Um, and then we knew through our friends at Live Nation and others that there was a recipe that, that all the ingredients were sitting on the table and just really looking for, you know, the, the bowl to mix it in. And that was, um, you know, there was sponsors looking to get behind a festival that, that was different. There was, there was Sean Carter, Jay-Z, you know, uh, wanted to put a festival together. And then w there was Philadelphia that was ripe for hosting something like this. So, um, so we had all these ingredients of, of a wonderful idea for, for a festival. And in, and in Philadelphia, um, Labor Day weekend from a, from a hospitality and tourism uh, perspective, which again is a major industry in Philadelphia, pretty empty, pretty empty week, pretty empty weekend. Um, and so, um, I was able to bring all the parties together um, with the mayor and others from the city um, to put together the right deal, if you will, um, so that that festival could happen there and that um, the festival would appropriately mobilize and utilize the, the, the grounds in, in the right way and, and also uh, make sure that the taxpayer wasn't held responsible for things that the festival would be held responsible for, which, of course, Fast forward seven years later, um, that's a very successful festival. It's delivered an average somewhere between twenty and thirty million dollars a year of economic impact to the to the economy in Philadelphia. It was made in America. Made in America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so that was that was the beginning of of our relationship with Rock Nation, putting that together, um, and then raising our hand to say, "Well, we'd just like to do your live stream, right? Because we want to do that." Mm -hmm. I would imagine you would, and they were. They said, "Of course, we would love to do that." Um, and that was something that all the other stakeholders and, and folks that were around the, the the festival, whether it be stage production and or all of the things and folks were involved. Nobody really wanted. Nobody was. That wasn't a niche for anybody. And we raised our hand and and offered to do it. And and um, um, we 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 did it in a way that goes back to the way we've been doing live events and live um, broadcast forever. Um, and I'll have to say that, you know, based on the feedback we got, we, it was extremely positive feedback mm -hmm. from Rock Nation, from the audience, from the sponsors. Everybody loved it. And um, maybe like two or three weeks later, um, Rock Nation asked us to come and, and broadcast one of, if you, if you recall, when the Barclays Center opened, there were eight nights to open the Barclay, which was Jay-Z for eight nights. Um, and so, um, at the time, uh, they'd asked to come, let come and talk about putting the eighth night on a live stream. And it turned out that it was on, uh, the life and times channel, which was the, the first thing that launched the life and times YouTube channel, which was Jay and rock nations, kind of one of their first entrees into, into live streams and, and, and platforms, um, and then we just continue to do a variety of things. Um, we made in America every year, and um, you know, if I and and, and um, title a couple years later came came about, and, mm -hmm. and we title were, is title, a, the music title, streaming music service, yeah. and uh, we were doing a lot there, and and you know, um, what what Rock Nation it, it's about empowering people. That's everything I've ever seen at Rock Nation is about empowerment, um, whether it be, and that's with why they, they empower their artists. They have athletes and all these things. It's about empowering everyone. And, and so I um, was in a meeting one day and, and just was asked a question about, hey, would, you know, are, do you have partners or what's your, what's that all about? And um, I don't, and really, you know, didn't, was thinking of the answer and, <laughs> and, and, and before that, it was just like, because, you know, the, the next, the next sort of conversation was an invitation to discuss a partnership mm -hmm. that really was very, it, to me, it made a lot of sense, which, which. Yeah. Meant, so what is the benefit for you from going from being independent to now joining this, this entertainment so, company? So, um, um, the, the philosophy about empowerment. Um, is about, you know, um, we're basically the more the merrier, if you will, in a way. Right. And so um, and, you know, what I do at ESM Productions, really from my responsibilities and what uh, serving as president and 
and, and, and being a shareholder and all of those things. Um, um, the only thing that's changed is it's a bigger company that's busier. Um, but you know, the, the thing that rock nation has done with all of its partners and, and I've seen it even at live nation with its partnership with, with rock nation, let entrepreneurs go and be there, be entrepreneurs, um, and, and, and go and run your company. And, and, you know, there's, uh, we're just going to help you make it bigger mm-hmm. and we're going to all do more together. And that's really, that's really the benefit. I mean, uh, and, and every day I wake up, um, running a bigger company than I was running yesterday. Um, at the, at the end of the day for me, you know, we, we're, we're doing an average of about 500 hours a year of live concert broadcasts. Wow. So mm-hmm. the eight year old kid yeah. who, who wanted to get into music and the 12 year old kid was watching the who, I think I hit, I think I found the place. You're right. So, it. so that to me, it, it just is tremendous. Do you think so, that's a, that this is a trend we'll see more of, uh, where entertainment companies want to have the piece of live events or, or that conversely uh, independent event companies will look to join large organizations so that they're, whether it's access to resources or, um, or, you know, whatever the benefits they may see in that. So I do, I do think that it, 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 it's, um, it, it might be a little bit unique because, because I think, I just happen to think rock nation is tremendously unique with the, the agility and, and the amount of, uh, efficiency, 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 English was not my major, um, <laughs> that, that, um, you know, nimble, right. Uh, um, uh, I've seen it, whether it's, you know, in, in a particular department or whether it's title, which is, which is not rock nation, but it's a very close relative, if you will, um, you know, with a small amount of people accomplish a tremendous amount. And, and there is just a, a work ethic and a positive attitude that is a major, major part of why it would work at all. And then of course the independence and the ability to let, to empower people, whether it be partner companies, whether it be people within organizations. So it, it, I think it's unique. Um, uh, and, uh, the, it, you know, for us, it was, you know, and I was not, you know, was, I like to say to folks, you know, to some degree, I was going along doing my thing and would have been really, really happy. We were still doing plenty of work with, with those, with Rock Nation and Tidal and all of these other things. Um, so it was an invitation that to be, uh, to, to, uh, to a part, when I would say party, but an invitation to something that, uh, not a lot of people are invited to. And, um, it's, when you hear people talk about, and this was not me, I didn't even know what it meant, but when you hear t- people talk about M&A or all those things, you know, they talk about, uh, you know, people say exit strategy. Mm-hmm. Well, this was an entrance strategy, if you think about it, because, okay. and I, I, all, we, all, all I did was enter a much larger platform in which I could contribute. Um, and, and so it's, 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 it's about more and bigger and doing, doing great things than it is about others who look for ways to, exit or, Mm -hmm. you know, those kinds of things. So there's the, those sort of business things. And then there's a creative part of it. Um, has that changed in any way or, um, how you approach things or, um, mindset or anything like that? How, how, how has the partnership affected you in that way? Well, I think there's so much, again, it's sort of like things have aligned, um, on the, on the things that we do with artists whether it be with title or other things that we're doing with artists, both rock nation and title uh, artists first all the time. Don't stand in the way of the artist creativity. Our job is to amplify it, which that's the 10 year old kid again. So I'm like, Hey, oh, so what do you mean? I just get to do exactly what this artist wants. That sounds great. Cause not a lot of people, not a lot of, I mean, that's a tremendous environment to be working in. Um, when it comes to corporate events and things that, you know, that, that we do, uh, all the time, whether it be a little bit different than a music event, whether mm-hmm. it be the inauguration of the Pennsylvania's governor or press conferences or corporate events we might do for clients like Comcast and others. That's there's the, nothing's changed with our, the, the amount of creative input that we would have. Um, we represent a production company's creative input in those situations completely 100 percent. That's that's an ESM legacy type of creative thing, if you will. Um, now, at the same time, we have access to a ton of creative minds 
at Rock Nation, whether it be designers that are that are that are in there doing things. So we're able to, to deepen our creative resources, um, which is again, it's the empowerment thing. Mm-hmm. It's it's, it, it, it's it's and that's just because we're we were in the you know we're in the Rolodex. We are all in the same. We can push the button right. and go, hey. So you think you might help us with that, or you know? So, but. Um, it's really just empowered us and has enabled us to just be bigger. Okay. More. Well, let's talk about some recent events then, because yeah. you've been busy lately. Yeah. Um, most recently, so the Super Bowl, the, um, the Music Fest from Bud Light. Tell us what your role was in that event. Yeah. So our role was to produce the broadcast or the live stream of um, the Super Bowl Music Festival Um Portions of it, not all of it are, are, are broadcast, but, but specific portions. And so that, that, that essentially meant, um, a, a pretty big show on Friday. There was about four hours worth of music on Friday night, uh, from the State Farm Arena, which has about 14,000 people in the audience. Um, and we came in and, uh, shot that in a, in a very high quality broadcast manner in which is how we shoot everything. And then, um, a second day there in the same venue, we had Post Malone. Yeah, I was gonna say I'll, I'll mention the the lineup. So yeah. you had uh, Ludacris and Migos and other Atlanta based acts, yes. and then uh, Bruno Mars and Cardi B. What everybody was talking about, yep. and uh, then Aerosmith and, and Post Malone. Yeah, yeah. Um, a lineup that you know rivaled or even overshadowed, I think, the halftime entertainment this year. Well, I think it was uh, you know all of music seemed to be in Atlanta over the weekend. Um, and so, um, and, uh, you know, I, music is, is a great, that's why, I mean, it goes back to the same thing. Music's a great convener and a great way for people to interact. So uh, it yeah. is, it was all over. Um, and I think just the, because the Super Bowl Music Fest was three days and f- several hours, four hours, whatever you want to call it, there's the ability to put so much more into it than the halftime show because the halftime show is 12 minutes or something. I forget what it is, but so which what, is also tremendous. By right. The way. Yeah. What, what, what's, what was the most challenging part from your perspective pulling this off? Um, so the, the most challenging part, so there are two things and, and we do this every day. So there wasn't, there wasn't a lot of insane challenges. Um, cause I think we were, we came to expect them. The Super Bowl, um, and we have some experience with this from PayPal and other other things. The Super Bowl is is an NSSC, a national special security event. So it has security protocols and and street closures and checkpoints and things like that that are a little bit out of the ordinary for every day anywhere, mm-hmm. <laughs> particularly Atlanta. And I think Atlanta um, is a great city for hosting events as well and knows how to deal with it. Um, however, that that going five blocks is going to take longer in a vehicle than it might normally. So under making sure and understanding, um, you know, we, we bring our team for uh, an event like this is about 50 people. And when Super Bowl events also, um, there are other folks are going to get the hotels right near the, right near the dome or right near the arena, like maybe the players and stuff. So mm-hmm. we get, we're a little further out of those. So we, there's some logistics around just moving our team mm-hmm. um, and getting them in and out and getting them through and, and things like that, which just, you just can't not think about it. Right. So it just takes planning. So it's a challenge, but it's a challenge. It's, that's easily overcome. Uh, the other big challenge on a, on a show, the Friday night show where you have, you went down the lineup for Friday a bunch of, a bunch of performers doing small sets and, um, us and, and the stage crew, which is the production people that are doing the event in the arena, not us. We're just there to put it on, on the air, um, staying in sync with them for the stage turns. And we're, we were literally, we had hosts and we're telling them in their ears what to say and writing stuff and then editing and shooting video packages on the fly so that the audience that's watching on, on the platform is not just staring at a stage for 10 minutes. And, but we don't know it's, te- we, it's one of these things where, again, it's welcome to live events. It's not like this, you've invented this or we've the first company to overcome it. Um, you don't know you have eight minutes until the eight minutes have passed. So you have to have all of these things in the shoot and, and, and just be ready to, you know, make it happen. And, and, um, we had that happen about three or four times during the show. And we have a great team and a little bit of luck 
was also helpful there. And I have to say that every one of those transitions that we had where the hosts were like, hey, let's watch this thing from the red carpet. And hey, Emmett Smith just did that. And let's go back. It all looks it all looked really planned on, on the air. And then and so I, I, I love those challenges, though. That, that's that to me. That's a lot of fun. And I was running around in the truck. Mm -hmm. going to the back where we edit the pieces and looking at them and timing them and running back up to my director and whispering into his ear, like, okay, we're going to go to the, we're going to go to the blue carpet and put this thing in. It's 40 seconds. In, and then I'll go back. And it just, all of that for four hours was, it was a lot of fun. Sounds like an adrenaline yeah, rush. So, totally so lots of how do you stay organized? With a lot of help. Uh, and as I said, we have, you know, there's a, uh, that, that team, on the ground was 50 people. Plus we have folks in, in our office that, that might not have to go to every location, but, but they're certainly helping us on the organization. Um, and there's a variety of things, tools to, to, that we use for organization. Uh, first and foremost, a really accurate, up-to-date, detailed production schedule. Okay. That's published, right? That everyone gets in real time who's on the team. And we use, um, we use, um, Slack as mm -hmm. another example to really make sure everybody's communicating and that the communication tree is right from the get go so that you're not spending, cause there's not a lot of time on live events to go and just, did you hear, did you hear it could take an hour to do, did you hear when you need that hour to actually achieve what everyone heard? Right. So really making sure that the information is, 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 is flowing to each ind individual who's, who needs it. Right. And then what's also really, really important in my view is in the field. And we're, we, this is an interesting thing to hear because it might contradict itself. Uh, we run our company as a thought meritocracy, meaning it doesn't matter what your position is. You have a good idea. We want to hear it. Even, mm -hmm. even if you disagree with me, there's a time and a place for that. And it's most of the time, quite honestly. But then there's this other time where, you know, like as an example, run around in the truck making sure that the show is happening. And then the thought meritocracy turns very, very quickly into a military command structure almost. Right. And very, very important because there are then, you know, that you cannot have two people saying, what do you think when there's, when the amount of time that it takes to say, what do you think is the amount of time you right. have to make the decision? Right. So it's, a, it's about execution and it didn't, it is. It so is. it's about, also, your taste level, right, or your um, your aesthetic, or your, yes, your there, yes, experience yes, that dictates yeah. to you what needs to happen at that moment. At, at the end of the day, yes, and what I do um, ultimately um, is, you know, when I'm in the truck and I'm in the truck for every live broadcast, and I'm watching the screen, and if there's something I don't like, or I'm, or I'm watching ten cameras, you know, if we have this, that we shot the music fest with ten cameras. If I see something cooking that I don't like, or I see something cooking that I do like, I'm steering that. And we have such a great team. We work together all the time. So a lot of that becomes, it's, it's muscle memory now, but there's always going to be, Hey, Scott, this just happened. What are we going to do? And there's no time for even a quick slack at that point. I got to be the one, you know, right. there's a, there's a, we, we do often make sometimes, you know, military or, or sometimes we'll make uh, a more of an airliner analogy where there's a captain, you know, it's not, it's not like we're an army and we're going to go shoot at people, mm -hmm. but we're on a flight. We treat it a little bit like a flight. We have a flight plan and we have a, we have a, we have a captain and we have a first officer for the mm -hmm. most part in the truck. And, and that the first officer who's our tech producer does most of the stuff. And then, you know, the, I, I will, say, okay, so we're able to do this, right? Or if I overhear that there might be, you know, as the lead up, if there's, I overhear some technical stuff, I'm going to ask to make sure that that's resolved. Right. Um, that's a friendlier metaphor there. The I, it is. We're not, yes, we're not, we don't, we do, it, we, we don't, we don't really do the yes, sir, yes, ma'am thing. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm going to say, I agree with you on the friendlier metaphor. We're the friendly, we're like National Guard or like Coast Guard. Or we're going to take a little break and come right back after this message from Hilton. So when's the big event? Hilton's here for planners with their exclusive customized meetings. Become a wow maker and save time by letting Hilton help you present an extraordinary event, one that leads to memorable and meaningful connections. Visit meetings.hilton.com and let Hilton help you. So that was interesting when you said if you, if you see something cooking that you you like. I'm wondering how you balance in your brain being able to 
be that captain and, and think of these very concrete things that need to be done. And at the same time, balancing the experience of what's happening and put your mindset, not that you're there to, you know, sway to the music and, you know, enjoy the dance along or whatever, sing along, but you want to have a sense of what's happening on stage, right? From an experience I think that's, I think that's, I think that's right. And, and, and yeah, how do you do that? Well, so I love all kinds of music, everything. So, so it becomes a labor of love right off the bat. Um, um, but, but also what, what, what I take very seriously and I get a lot of joy from is I, I'm, I'm the audience advocate. Um, I'm, I'm trying to deliver to the audience where that audience, and it depends on the event, right? A lot of the broadcast events, our audience, primary audience is remote and they're watching all over the world, right? So what we're creating for them is, is is special, right? Now, at the same time, we have to do that without completely alienating the audience that's in the room, right? And that's important, right? You know, putting a camera in front of everybody doesn't help. So figuring out how to keep cameras, not just out of the way of people in the arena, but also when you can, you don't want to see a bunch of cameras in the, in the experience you're watching, right? So work really, really hard for that. And I get a lot of joy from that. So if it's music that I like, if it's a, if it's a band that I'm a fan of, um, I am, I'm able to just, you know, that's, it's, it's always great to look at the replay when, to, to, when I want to sway my head, uh, I'm enjoying it in the moment. And we, all of us in the truck are jamming and are snapping our fingers and, and we're, and we're cheering when we see a great shot. If something really great just happened, cause you know, these, some of these artists do things that you don't know are going to happen and we catch it and, and it looked cool there. You'll hear cheers and we're high-fiving each other and, and, and really having a, a lot of fun delivering something special for the audience. Um, when we had posts the other night, it was, it was, and it was cool. And it was something that the audience really, really dug. And that was, it was, it was, it was the desire of everyone for us to follow post from his dressing room and do everything he does backstage for about three and a half minutes before he went on. Right. So, and, wait, so he knew this was happening. Oh yeah, he and knew when, it was happening, and and everybody was all part of what everybody wanted to have happen. Okay, right. And we spend. I have a person detailed, um, a, a stage manager detailed to that three minute segment live, live, mm -hmm. right? That that is supposed to happen, and we work all day for, for on something that was one hundred percent natural. There was no staging of any kind. But we worked all day and walked it and rehearsed it and blocked it so that it would work and look natural, right? And here's a guy, he's just like literally walking down the hallway and it is no, it is a, it is a coincidence, although it looked like no coincidence. The only thing he drinks is Bud Light. This is what is, that's his thing. It's been that thing when you he promise. was. You promise. It, it, no, it's been his thing. Like from what I was told, it's been his thing even before he was, you know, it, it, he tells a story on stage. It wasn't that long ago where he was like in his car rattling for looking for quarters to buy to buy a beer or whatever it's not his success is pretty fresh so he can he remembers what it was like but so you know having him with a bud light and and hanging backstage with his production manager is really his partner in this show and just the audience getting a chance to see that um was really special and we pulled it off we did it and it's it was like three cameras and where they stop and don't trip over the cables i mean there's a whole thing we we're backstage the backstage not really meant for this and it when it worked perfectly because 10 or 15 people worked really hard all day for this little shot we were all high-fiving each other in our truck because we just knew that the audience they were they love that stuff they love seeing this behind the scenes real behind the scenes stuff. Mm -hmm. so I, I think it's really if the audience if we're giving delivering something cool to the audience um, that's enough for me. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's move on from the Super Bowl. Um, although I'm sure you have so many stories about that, uh, to another recent event, you worked on the inauguration events for the governor of Pennsylvania, Tom Wolf. Um, you were the event producer for the inaugural committee. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what, what was your scope of work there? So our scope of work, uh, was to, um, execute, create and execute the the um, inaugural celebration, which sometimes is called the ball, mm -hmm. um, they chose with celebration, which I think is 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 probably more fitting for what we did versus a ball. I think people hear ball, they think really fancy tuxedos and gowns and 
ballroom dancing, which certainly it was a great party, but it was not that. Um, and so, uh, and then we, 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 put it, we put most of our efforts and resources into the celebration, but we also, um, really just to help because we, we wanted to be able to, um, have our fingerprints on both things. And they, and, and they asked us for the help, the, the swearing in the actual act of standing in front of the Capitol in the freezing cold, by the way, outside on a big stage, take the oath of office, um, and, and to deliver the uh, inaugural address was something that, we helped just to make the footsteps um, work. Um, but the celebration, the big party, was for about 4,000 people in a venue in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, that's that's called the Pennsylvania Farm Show Complex. Now, what a great name, because it was built for this gigantic annual event called the Pennsylvania Farm Show, mm -hmm. which happens at the top of the year every year. And it's actually in some book somewhere, some old almanac, where... It says, and the governor shall be sworn in the first Tuesday after the farm show. It actually says that in some 200-year-old book. Um, I was fortunate enough both 16 years ago and 12 years ago to, to produce Governor Rendell's inaugural events. They were also at the farm show. So I had some experience with uh, very compressed loading. We had about 36 hours to take essentially a car show that had tractors and hay and sheds. I mean, it just was a big like a county fair mm -hmm. type of thing and turn it into a big party with a stage um, where we had the roots perform actually and others pens roots from philly of course so Absolutely. a bunch of pennsylvania uh, artists performed and it was just a really big fun party um that we embraced the fact that we we're at the farm show we didn't hide it we didn't i mean it's a seventy-five thousand square foot room that we didn't carpet because you know what? We're at the farm show. The carpet's not going to change that. So we put tra we put antique tractors in there and bales of hay and made a big couple big um, beer garden with the picnic tables and really nice Pennsylvania food and wine and beer. And we had a great band. And Was that a hard sell? Not at all. No, because this is what was great about it. The whole project was a pleasure because um, uh, Governor Wolf is uh, just a tremendous gentleman, a great guy. And... Um, not, not a career politician, right? He came from private business and is truly serving the people of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. He donates his salary, he drives around in a Jeep. I mean, he's the real money, put, put your money where your mouth is. And he's just really trying to work really hard to, to affect some change. And he's, and he has, and that's why I got reelected. And so he's kind of a chill guy, I guess you could say. And, and in political events, um, Usually, you know, you have a very, you have a lot of sponsors, a lot of lobbyists, mm -hmm. and they can sometimes really drive and steer and you wind up, you know, having to navigate a lot of those things which can make, can make for a hard sell, as you had said. But, uh, we were empowered is another, another, another word, the empowerment. Uh, the governor empowered the, the two co-executive directors, of the inaugural committee were two folks that I had had previous experiences with on some other, political slash music events. And I sent those guys an email saying, Hey, you know, it'd be fun, it'd be fun to do this and pull together a bunch of Pennsylvania companies. And um, which is what we did because the, the other vendors I, that you worked with. Yeah. Because, mm -hmm. because a, 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 a little known fact, and I'll touch on this briefly, but a little known fact is there's this little town called Lidditz, Pennsylvania. Um, that that's their one. That may not be as little known fact, but the little known fact is that some of the world's greatest suppliers of equipment and talent in the touring music industry globally, leaders are in Lidditz, Pennsylvania. Um, and so uh, Claire Audio is an example, Upstage Video, um, Tate Towers, um, Rock Lidditz is this really amazing rehearsal space, um, Atomic Design, mm -hmm. I don't miss any, right? Okay, I don't wanna miss anybody. But, um, and and um, so when, when we were uh, beginning this process, which was a pretty compressed timeline, and we really started Right before the holidays, um, the, the, you know, this end of December, and this thing was January fifteenth, right? So it was a very compressed timeline, which we're used to. It was not a problem. I picked up the phone and 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 spoke to a variety of those folks and said, "Hey, wouldn't it be really cool if we all came together and did this?" Um, and they made it. I mean, it was it was a tremendous it was a tremendous effort. Um, it was a pretty big show, you know five or 600 lights as an example, right? I mean, a big everything, big everything. Um, 
And um, so it was fun to do that. It was really a lot of fun. It was fun to have the Roots who are friends and just, it was, it was really neat. And I had an opportunity to see the governor at another event that he didn't know we were running a couple of weeks ago. Um, and I saw him there and he was like, Hey, and he's still glowing about how much fun everybody had. So it was really, it was hard work. Um, but, but, um, tremendously successful. For us. So another major event, this is a couple of years ago, but I, but I want to talk about it because it, it, was uh, historic in many ways, was Pope Francis' visit to the United States for the World Meeting of Families, which took place in Philadelphia. Uh, You were involved in that. So tell us what your role was for that event. So I was the executive producer of all of the events that happened in in Philadelphia there, Um, or not all of them, I'd say all the big broadcast ones. Um, And actually we were the, ESM Productions was actually the broadcast entity that delivered those images to the world. I think it was like 2 billion people or something. Um, and so the big events that that um, fell under our, our responsibility were two major events. So designing and building stage and the overall, the entire event footprint, including all of the back of house infrastructure for arrival and the papal party and a huge press infrastructure. Um, there were two events that we used that area for. One was called the World Meeting of Family or the Celebration of Families, which was attended by the Pope. Um, but that was the event that had all the music and a little bit of the folks from around the world telling their stories. Um, that was in a big fireworks show and a big um, projection mapping thing on the Philadelphia Museum of Art. That was a big concert gala thing that which we produced, got all the talent, put that entire thing together, and we shot it and and distributed it to the world. The next day, the papal mass happened at that same location. So in the middle of the night, you turn a concert stage into a sanctuary. Everyone's done that, right? <laughs> um, Wait, well, for some people, <laughs> the, the Pope is the ultimate rock star. Yeah, right? for sure. And and, and uh, we had him in Independence Hall as well. And, and um, it was a tremendous experience, uh, the largest NSSC in U.S. history still, as far as I know. And a tremendous experience, lots and lots of hard work. Um, but, um, well, what was the most memorable thing for you about that event? Um, I, two things. One, I, I was able to introduce Aretha Franklin to the Pope. Um, and, um, I was the one who invited Aretha to come to play for the Pope. And that was, uh, the ability to do someone else. I mean, if you're Aretha Franklin, um, who I worked with a number of times, I always thought she was awesome and great and tremendously talented. But, but as a person, she was also really cool. Um, most of the time, I think you're in a position where you're, you know, management or somebody's coming to you with a list of, this is what everybody wants from you today. These are the favors and requests that everybody wants from you. So to be the person that says, hey, somebody wants to offer you something that we think you might like. And she jumped at the chance. And I didn't know it at the time, but she was already kind of sick. Um, and what I did know from Aretha, Aretha never, even even in her earlier days, it never really flew. Mm-hmm. So it would always take a bus, right? So she took the bus, we got her, we, we you know, and when, when you'd, and she needed to rehearse a little bit. So she was in town for a few days and I got a chance to visit with her a little bit. And it was just a great experience. So for me, you know, asking her if this would be something she would like to do. And of course, it was, it was an honor and a, and a privilege for her to do that and being the one to put that together and actually walk her up to, to the Pope and make that introduction, I think was, was probably one of the coolest things. And then the other really cool thing was I was walking and I always do, I always treat myself like I'm a regular member of the audience. I tuck my credential away and I go through whatever door everyone has to go through. And I, I try to see what it's like. And I wind up in the middle of the event site trapped essentially in barricade and, human gridlock a little bit. It's early in the morning, early in the morning. Um, and basically what happens, and it's not uncommon for, you know, there's thousands and thousands of people working on drawings, putting up barricades and, and there's you know, somebody's going to miss something. Mm-hmm. Right. And so this is how you find it. So I get on the radio and I get the appropriate security people from the different departments. And I say, Hey, take a look. I think we're, we should have, this, this feels a little tight to me. I think we should have a, a, an opening here, a blowout as we call it. Right. Um, and a guy walks up and whispers, he goes, okay, but you know, if we do that, those six people right there have to move. Right. And I was like, yeah, I know. So now 
the security folks walk up and they first thing they do is they say, and I don't know, the folks didn't even really, they were from somewhere else. They were pilgrims. They, English was not their first language. But they said, okay, can you guys just move over for a couple of minutes? We just need to make some adjustments. And the people could see, they were smart enough to see what was happening with the adjustments. And they could see that their standing spot was evaporating and they started to cry. They like, they came to see the Pope, right? And they're 2000 feet away from the stage and they just lost their spot. And they're starting to cry. Well, I had tickets in my back pocket to 50 feet away from the Pope. These people weren't anybody. They were nobody. To, to they weren't. I mean, they were. They were very important to the Pope and very important to us. But they weren't donors or sponsors or anything mm-hmm. like that. And I was able to, as we say, Billy Joel them right to the front. And these people now they were really crying. <laughs> um, so to be able, those two things honestly were were you know, probably the highlight of, because of the, you know, the audience thing or whatever, mm-hmm, but I did that. Mm-hmm. I was able to relocate a few regular folks up to the front for the mass, which made, you know, folks who've traveled, there are people, we, we read about them I and people traveled from South America. Right. This was a pilgrimage. Yeah. And it's just like, you know, to get to, and then to get somebody who, you know, you never met before, you never see again. They're like, yeah, go ahead all the way up front to, I mean, literally 50 feet, hundred feet away from the boat. Um, was I felt like that to do that it makes means way more than anything else that could ever possibly come out of that. So I'm wondering what what does a city learn from an event like that? Like does that does it change anything about the event infrastructure or the collective knowledge of a city once you have successfully a, pulled off an event like that? Sure. Yeah. I think I think I think Philadelphia. Um, you know, it's been a it's been a, 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 a at least a 20 year process of of hosting big events, um, and becoming better and better at them. That, that one, I think, um, had a little bit of a balance of, yeah, Philly knows how to host big events and it certainly does. And there were, you know, at the end of the day, there weren't really any bad and that's nothing bad came out of it from a safety or security perspective. Um, the, uh, the once in a lifetime, nature of the papal event balanced with some of the inconvenience that as you get closer to the event sites, if you're a resident or something like that is, is something that is a difficult balance. And, and in a, in a city like Philadelphia, um, very different than in a city like New York, you know, the Pope was here uh, before I forget if it was right before, or right after, but you know, he's gone down, he's gone down fifth Avenue and then like seventh Avenue, it's just a regular day. Right. Well, Philly didn't really do that. Philly, Philly, you know, the Pope's going down Benjamin and Franklin Parkway, like a mile in either direction. It was not a regular day. And I think that was a challenge for for everyone um, um, because, you know, the, they're. But how do you prepare if everyone if everyone says too many people are coming? How do you prepare? It's a tough position to be in. Um, and so uh, but I think that. They they learn, um, and you know the city the city is still uh, really really good. There's you know things on this, in, in in Philly, and I think I, I've been in a lot of cities. And I, one thing I say about Philly, for sure, is way ahead of the curve on in two things for a very long time. Homeland security, Philly has been ahead for of the curve for many many years, and things that you know that people in our industry. Maybe they notice now or they start to notice, you know, like the blocking vehicles and, mm-hmm. and just different things where big things are water replacement. There's a whole host of things that can go into security planning or incident planning that Philadelphia was was, was um, doing for a long time. But before, sadly, some of these incidents happened around the world where then everybody says, well, because of that, this is what we do. Philly's been doing it all along. And I, and I think New York's also really been great at it as well, obviously. Um, so it's a partnership and, and that's the, the thing that when security and this thing we did for the papal event, it was a year, literally a year, every Wednesday in our office in Philadelphia, we met and it was a secret service and it was the local law enforcement. It was everybody was responsible for securing the event, met with people who were responsible for producing the event and the person representing the millions of people in the audience, mm-hmm. um, and it's funny, I had this chat with, with Governor Wolf um, at, at, uh, at the event, uh, the inaugural event. Um, he was in one meeting. He was pretty new. Um, he, he started in 2015. 
and he was in one meeting and I, and I could see what was happening prior to him kind of showing up at this meeting and it was all emergency management people. And it's very important. It's very important. Um, um, but there was, there was an idea being floated around by, I forget who, by somebody that, you know, well, if we declare an emergency, it opens up these channels. And I'm like, I went up to the governor. I didn't care. I walked up to the governor and I said, please don't let anyone declare this an emergency. I said, I know it might, it might seem like the easy thing to do from a paperwork perspective. I said, but it will kill the, this event, please. From a, from a public perception standpoint. Yeah. Like, yeah, like it, it, you know how like declare when, you know, when, when a real disaster happens, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, governors and presidents and everybody, they can declare emergencies. It cuts a ton of red tape on opening up funding mechanisms, or you can go and get the proper consultant without going through this big, long bid process. I mean, it's designed for that. And they wanted to figure out how to get some of those resources un unblocked. And somebody's like, well, why don't we just declare this an emergency? And I'm like, please, no, no. You know, it's not an emergency. Uh, it, it's, and, and um, there's a fine line, right? There's a fine line between right. that. And, and, I think cooler heads prevailed there, um, and, and I think that's what cities are learning and have learned in general is that, you know, there needs to be, can't, it can't be silos, it needs to be a real collaboration mm -hmm. between the cities, whether it's operating departments, which obviously has a lot to do with police, transportation, public safety, health, ADA, I mean, all those things, the cities, and, and of course, what's the rest of the business that needs to be conducted going to do? Because... Yeah, great. You're an event, but the world must go on. Exactly. And that's a very important uh, perspective mm -hmm. to take, in my view. So interesting. But well, before we, we wrap up, I wanted to, because we've talked a little bit about your your experiences live streaming and broadcasting, yeah. and you you have that expertise, uh, maybe talk about some, some best practices and, and how it's changed. Like when you started doing live streaming, um, I know you mentioned, you know, you've been doing the live stream of Made in America since 2012. Here we are seven years later. What What is different? Yeah. Um, so I know that, um, I, we, we've been, we've been in the, in the, you know, live stream slash you know, before that it was called internet video, right? Um, we've been in that, in that space for, I'd say the better part of 15 or plus years when it was really, I don't want to say experimental, but a little bit experimental. And, and a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that we did in the beginning of that was, was in the, um, the corporate, uh, and like investor relations side of things where that honestly is where they were some of the first pioneers in communicating with an audience that way were, were um, you know, financial institutions or quarterlies and external communications in, in publicly traded companies. And we did a lot of that. Some of that was live and some of that was shoot it, edit it real quick and then get it on the website. Right. We've been doing that for a really long time. Um, but we've also have been doing for a really long time and, you know, you might say I, I probably had the first experience when I was about eight years old, sitting in a TV studio with my dad. Um, but in the professional experience, we're doing live TV for a long, long time. And live stream, um, particularly the way we're doing it, and we're, there are others that are doing it, it's a very high quality broadcast, both sound and pictures, all the way through. There's virtually no difference. And I would say to folks in the beginning of live stream music, I would go, this is, this is an, I would, I would say, you know, this is an HBO special or a Showtime special up until the point where it gets encoded and put into a, into a system that allows people to watch it on their devices. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the real truth about it is, you know, and it's the same thing when HD, um, old enough to remember when HD was it like that was a thing. Was it HD? It's like that's almost like you know anybody's not HD now. It's like it's like black why and white. We, why are we watching yeah. this? <laughs> so so, um, but your HD is only going to look as good as your whatever your lens your first original shot was, right? And so you know there was in the beginning of internet streaming or broadcast, whatever those words are that people say. There was this notion that, well, it's only on the internet anyway, so let's not worry about quality. And we were, we would say even back then in day one, well, no, that's, you know, with all due respect, we couldn't disagree with you more, right? Because if you start with a really crisp high res image, when it goes through compression, which is a fancy word for all the stuff it does, right? 
it, you have a chance of it looking better than if you start off with a, with a with a low res image, right? Um, and same thing with lighting and sound and 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 all those things. So, but from a technical perspective, you know, we work really hard on making sure that it, we have some input on lighting, which is, you know. My dad told me this a million years ago. When you see director of photography and a movie credit, that's lighting. Mm -hmm. There's nothing. It's lighting is everything, and I learned that when I was five years old. So, <laughs> lighting is everything, and, and and of course, audio is really really important when you're doing music. So we do we go a lot. Uh, we do we go the extra step with mixing it specifically for for broadcast and things like that. But the most important thing um, f at the end of the day is that the audience can view it in, in a of smooth experience, right? And so all the back end stuff, and then, you know, a little bit, it's a little bit proprietary, but not all the way. I mean, all the back end stuff is, is very robust in terms of delivering it to people globally through the internet, through content delivery networks, active engineering people watching traffic and not treating that as, okay, just plug it in there and the internet takes it. No, no, no. We're with it. We're with it. We're constantly monitoring. And, and if there is any kind of, you know, we treat it like, you know, there's somebody who's like the traffic reporter, like the, like, you know, Hey, the Deegan's backed up. Well, we have, we can look at stuff like that in, in, in the internet world and be ahead of it enough to be able to reroute. Like if, Hey, don't take the Deegan, take whatever mm -hmm. street. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, we have people doing that as in addition to making great pictures and that, and we do it quickly and we come in and we're friendly. And I think that's, <laughs> That's been our secret. <laughs> so, so when someone asks you, they say, we need a live stream. What's your first question? Um, we, our first question is, what is it? it? What, what's your event? Right. And try to understand what it is and try to understand, is, is, it, is it an event for a live audience in addition to the live stream? Um, sometimes we have to make sure that they you're using the word live stream in, in the way that we would interpret it. Sometimes people think that that's just a new word for, we need to feed something we're doing in this auditorium to something down the street or in a different auditorium. And that's not really, they say, we want to stream from here to here. And that's a different type of stream. Um, so we want to, we want to understand what's happening in the point of, of origination. Mm -hmm. and we want to understand who's on the other end and where are they? Approximately how many might there be? And how do they, do you have a, do you have a plan of how you're going to give them the button to push to watch it? Or, and if you don't, that's okay. We can, we can do that. So it's really a discovery process of what it is that's happening. And sometimes, you know, believe it or not, you know, you wind up with the people that are on stage know that you want to do this. Well, we'll tell them eventually like, okay, we'll probably want to get consent there too. Um, and Good then, point. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then, you know, it is about the originating venue. And, and, and then getting, you know, the technical infrastructure solution figured out, which, you know, knock on wood, there's, we always figure it out, but there are a variety of solutions to get whatever's happening inside this venue out to the world, depending on whether it's satellite or microwave or fiber or a whole host of other things, right. but getting, understanding that and that we have enough time and, and real estate to do our job. Mm -hmm. Where, where do you recommend live streams go in terms of, um, uh, delivery, like Twitter, you mentioned, we did uh, Twitter. Yeah. So we did Facebook. Twitter. What's the easiest to work with, or is it, Matt, is it more a question of the events audience? Like where those people live or how do you figure is. that out? I think it is. I think it has a lot to do with whose job it is. And, and sometimes we're a big part of it. Sometimes, you know, we're helping just figure out the strategy, but you know, where's the audience expecting it? Where are we, where, where are we, where, where's the rally point? Right. And I think, you know, it, it really depends on the nature of the event. Um, obviously stuff that we do on title is on title, right. And that's the rallying point. And that, and that, that, that is a model that we've seen work tremendously for the, the fans of the stuff that's on the title platform is that now they, that's where they know, they know to expect it. And that's where they go for it. Um, Twitter is a tremendous platform. I think, um, we'll also have um, a, a lot of this um, because then folks with Twitter audiences can drive people to an event page that, you know, three or four different people that or, or entities that have Twitter handles and audiences can go, hey, watch this. And it's there. And Twitter makes it pretty, pretty easy to interact and interface. And, um, you know, they, they take a um, uh, we like the we like the we like the technology, you know, we just hand it to them. Um, and they're not trying to 
do anything encoding wise, not editorial, I'm talking about technically, but they're not mm-hmm. trying to do anything technically that might degrade the look. Okay. Um, or editorially for that mm-hmm. matter. But, but, uh, and so then we've also done things where if somebody has an audience, then we we can put it right. If you if you're a brand or a personality that already has people coming to wherever that is every single day, in, in by the millions, or you can get people by the millions to go to a festival page or whatever, then put it on a, put it on the festival page and skin it and have it there. What I what I haven't seen work is the transactional pay per view. Okay. And I just and I and I and I even th- there's every most of the times I see them in the news. You know, they wind up having to do a lot of refunding. But you have a whole, you have a whole customer service mm-hmm. uh, piece that you got to add on to that. Where so a recent tricky. example would be the the sporting events. Uh, no, that's they do a that, subscription or? thing. Okay. The subscription is a little bit different because obviously titles a subscription and that works. I'm talking about like, hey, you want to watch this one thing, and then you got to go log on to a website one time and pay ten dollars one time, and then it's then you hit click and it's supposed to work, right? And then, but the challenge there is. And this is different than cable TV or any anything or 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 any subscription based platform like Title or anything like that because it's an existing login. Here you ha- it's like a it's like a really short lived thing, and you know you you log on and it's not working. Now you want your money back. Meanwhile, it's probably your router mm-hmm. or it's your internet service provider and the people that are selling the show, it's not their responsibility, but they wind up having to try to talk you through it. And it's messy. Right. And so it's, I, I've, I have found, we don't do a ton of that. And I've had folks ask what, what I think. And I usually say that I say, you know, you're better off if you can either go on a subscription platform that already has done that or put something up there that's sponsor driven, like Super Bowl was, where it's just like the, the model there is not to sell eyeballs to subscribe. The model there is, Share this great thing that that and this great environment that both Bud Light had and EA Sports had, and their brand association with it is was successful. Right, that yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Um, Scott, thank you so much My for pleasure. joining us. Yeah. And before Thanks. we yeah. let you go, tell yeah. our listeners how they can learn more about what you do and and reach you. Yeah, absolutely. So esmproductions.com uh, is the website, and all of our all of our uh, contacts and social stuff is all there, and probably one of the only companies um, that I know of that if you actually went there and found my face on the website, you can actually find all my contact info, including my email. So thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. Thanks, Scott. Before we go, I wanted to plug our new venue coverage on BizBash. We have a new round of location scouts, which curate 10 best new or renovated venues for events in cities across the United States and Canada. Sign up for our BizBash daily newsletter to have these delivered straight to your inbox. Gather Geek's producer is Dave Nelson. Our editorial liaison is Claire Hoffman. And our audience development maven is Rebecca Pappas. Thanks for listening and gather on. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you like what you're hearing, be sure to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or your favorite podcast app. We can be found on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Player FM, Google Play, and Pocket Cast. Be sure to leave us a reading and review. It helps others discover the Gather Geek's podcast. We'd also love to hear from you. You can leave feedback on Twitter at GatherGeeks or leave us an email, gathergeeks at bizbash.com. We hope you'll join us again for the next episode of Gather Geeks. Until then, gather on.